Thank you very much for the introduction. I have no relevant disclosures for this talk. So as we already heard, there are two main categories of intervention that you can do for a glenoid bone loss in a shoulder instability patient. One being the iliac crest bone graft family, let's call it that way. And the other one being the coracoid transfer or latage procedure done with various types of fixation. And uh, one of the subtypes of the iliac crest bone graft transfer is the so-called J-bone graft that we heard about uh, a little bit today. It's an implant-free J-shaped graft that you impact in the anterior aspect of the scapular neck in order to avoid placement of any implants at all. So you don't have any buttons and you don't have any, any screws. I'll show you a quick surgical video. You can see the conjoint tendon. We perform this procedure open. You do a horizontal split of the subscapularis and of the capsule. You can see the separate split of the subscap and uh, the capsule performed right here. Then you create an anterior access to the scapular neck, which is visualized nicely using a Fukuda. And then after you have exposed the anterior scapular neck, you perform an osteotomy using a chisel. You perform a about 50 millimeters deep osteotomy and about two, uh, two centimeters wide with a slightly oblique angle towards the glenoid surface, about 15 to 20 degrees. And then you harvest an iliac crest and it's bicortically harvested. And then you shape it into the letter, into the form of the letter J. So this is what the final graft looks like. And once you have this graft, this is about the, the, ex, um, the size of the graft, you can impact it into the osteotomy of the scapular neck that you created previously. Have to take care a little bit not to break the graft while you insert it into the osteotomy. As you see, the, the graft is quite proud. It's uh, quite lateral. So what you have to do once it's inserted is to use a burr and burr it down so that it nicely fits the concavity of the remainder of the, of the glenoid. You can see the preoperative image, this is the postoperative image, and you can see what happens with the graft at follow-up and looks quite nice after the remodeling is complete. So now we, we all have been at several congresses and we all have discussed about different techniques and uh, several authors have shown great results with their technique and it's not really clear which technique is better than the other. There's no true gold standard in, in my opinion. And uh, so what we thought about is doing a level one randomized control trial, which uh, is maybe able to show which technique prevails over the other. At least we attempted to do so. So our hypothesis was that the clinical results of an iliac crest bone graft transfer are better than the results of the coracoid transfer for treatment of anterior shoulder instability with glenoid bone loss. And what we did, did is a quite complex uh, study protocol. It was a bicentric prostate prospective randomized trial, tra uh, 30 coracoid transfers versus 30 iliac crest bone graft transfers. We, of course, had local ethical committee approval of both centers. We did a trial registration prior to the beginning of the surgery in order to ensure that we couldn't change the outcome parameters later on, to be more honest. We had inclusion criteria of anterior shoulder instability and the glenoid defect. We had, of course, also exclusion criteria as, for example, concomitant and cuff tears, etc. Previous surgery, except for open arthroscopic bank cut repair, were also excluded, and any neuromuscular pathologies, including seizure disorders, were excluded. Of course, also infection and compliance problems. And this is, of course, for both groups. We had a computer-based randomization process, and uh, it took us about three years to collect all this uh, data in two centers. Uh, four surgeons performed the techniques, and both, or all four, uh, two were from one center and two from the other center, and all four had a vast experience with both techniques, so that it will be a fair comparison. And also both centers had a similar post-op rehab protocol. The longitudinal follow-up was a clinical examination, including both zero, subjective shoulder value, range of motion, strength, and ad adverse events, so also you could say complications, and we had a CT pre or post-op and follow-up examination. And the main outcome measurement was the VOSI score. The two years follow-up was 90%, uh, a little bit lower for the coracoid transfer group. The technique, just in short, was the standard technique according to Latage, or better to say the modification published by Gilles Walsh, with, uh, fixed with two screws, and the uh, technique for the iliac crest bone graft transfer was the technique according to Herbert Resch. We did a group comparability in order to show if it's a fair comparison between both groups, and we didn't see any significant differences between both, 
groups regarding factors like age, gender, number of instability and episode, the duration of instability, the cause of instability, whether they were hyperlax or not, and so on. And this is the, the final results. You can see the longitudinal follow-up. Uh, so you can see that at 24 months follow-up, there was no difference in the VOSI score in the main outcome measurement between the both techniques. So there was no difference. And also in the other clinical scores, like subjective shoulder value, there was also no difference to be found. Also the row score was the same. And also this uh, sport-specific ASSO score was also the same for both groups. What about the range of motion, abduction, external rotation, no difference there as well. Uh, we expected some difference, to be honest, in the external rotation group um, parameter, but we didn't find any. What we found was rather surprising. We saw a significant difference in the internal rotation. The Latage was significantly worse at 6, 12, and 24 months follow-up regarding internal rotation, likely due to subscapularis, impairment, hindering, or entrapment, whatever you might consider the cause, and also the high internal rotation was significantly worse. Regarding strength, however, we could not find a limited strength of the Latage group in internal rotation, but we tested internal rotation at a neutral position where you can also activate the packed major to use as an internal rotator. So we tested in a functional position rather than an isolated subscapularis position. Regarding CT scans, you can see that the black line is, again, is the, the J-bone graft. You can see that the J-bone graft actually augments the glenoid more than the Latage does, but in a slightly unnatural way. So you overcorrect with both techniques, and the J-bone graft overcorrects a little bit more. And due to the remodeling processes, you can see that this uh, increase in size is attenuated by the remodeling effect, so that in the end, they will be about the same, with the, with the exception that the uh, J-bone graft patients showed a deeper concavity in the end than the Latage patients. And this is according to previous findings that we published, and Dr. Di Giacomo also published in the Jesus. Of course, we need to talk about adverse events, and uh, this is maybe a point where I disagree with Dr. Hantes. Uh, he showed some uh, radiological papers of ours and said there is no mention in the literature of the complications of the iliac crest, which I believe is not true because we published this in 2006, the first time, and last year also, our complications with the iliac crest of the pelvis, and they are there then they need to be mentioned. Uh, so whenever we talk about comparison between surgical techniques, we have to be honest. Uh, that is very important. So we had in this uh, example, in this study, we had eight patients with donocyte hypesthesia of the iliac crest. So this is a relevant problem. I totally agree. Uh, and we need to talk about that. And this is also the reason why there are efforts to change from an autograph to an allograft, which so far the, the results are not that great, at least in our hands. We see a lot of resorption with allografts, but maybe in the future we'll get better allografts. What about the other um, complication and adverse events? We didn't see any dislocations in either group, but we saw one subluxation in the Latage group and two in the J-bone graft group. There was one revision in the Latage group because of screw irritation and one pseudoarthrosis in the Latage group, but it didn't require a revision surgery. Similar to the Pascal Bolot group, uh, you can obviously also obtain a good clinical result in some cases when there is a pseudotrosis, apparently. And there was one graft breakage in the J-bone graft group, also that one did not require revision surgery. And then some more unspecific problems like wound problems and hematoma. So to the discussion, the J-bone graft and the Latage procedure showed no difference regarding the main outcome measurement, which was the Bosi score. There was no difference regarding stability. There was a significant limitation of internal rotation capacity after the Latage compared to the J-bone graft. The glenoid augmentation effect of the iliac crest was larger than the one of the coracoid transfer, but this difference was attenuated over time did not exist anymore so much after the passing of time. And there was a different spectrum of complications, most notably the iliac crest in the, in the group of the J-bone graft and the screw irritations in the group of the Latage. There were also some um, limitations, of course, as with every study, the follow-up in the Latage group was a little smaller and there was no blinded outcome assessment. However, the main outcome measurement is patient reported and so you don't have to blind it. And the conclusion of our study was that the J-bone graft technique and Latage procedure for treatment of anterior shoulder instability with glenoid bone loss show comparable clinical results in the short-term follow-up. So we had to dismiss our, our hypothesis that it was actually better. It was not better, it was the same. 
And uh, just to point out, what about long term? Because this is young patients. We need to look at uh, the longevity of our results because two years is nothing in the lifetime of a 20 year old. So you need to look at 20 and more years. So what we did is we examined in a retrospective case series some older cases uh, done by Herbert Resch between 1993 and 2000. And uh, we did a follow-up examination retrospectively. We achieved about 75% uh, of follow-up after an average of 18 years with a minimum follow-up of 15 years. And uh, just want to show you quickly what is very important, I believe. And this is the event of uh, instability atropathy. So what you can see here is the preoperative instability atropathy on average. So this will be the average semilis and prieto score, if you want, 0.2. Then at midterm, you have 0.6, and at long term, you have 0.9. So almost every patient on average had at least a little bit of osteoarthritis, instability osteoarthritis. And what is written there with the red dot is 0.4. This is the contralateral <coughs> side. So you can see that even by achieving a stable shoulder, you're not able to halt this process that will finally lead you to the de degeneration, unfortunately. Just to compare that to the results of the Latagé, this is all the Latagé studies with more than 10 years of follow-up. You can see it's about the same. It's 0.8 for the Latagé, 0.9 for the, for the J-Bone graft studies. So the conclusion is the J-Bone graft technique and the Latagé are equal not only in the short term, but likely also equal in the long-term follow-up. Thank you very much.